Okay, my friends, I'm going to show you something right now that it's very hard to explain. They're talking about Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic field protects us from harmful particles in solar wind. There's particles everywhere in space. They're just everywhere, saturated in space. Tons of dust, electrons, photons, all kinds of things that everything that is spinning through space has to scrub through. They think that the Earth is made with an iron core. They have absolutely no idea what's inside the Earth. None. Zero. And they just assume that there's a magnetic field being generated by a swirling iron core inside. That's just not correct. There is no iron core in the Earth that they can, can verify is there. Now, wave oscillates around every seven years causing this propagation of westward 1,500 kilometers a year. The fields are switching and changing due to our scrubbing through space. All right? I'm, I'm just going to leave it at this, but it charges up and discharges, charges, discharges, charges, discharges. That's what happens as particles scrub through and gain energy and then dissipate it. Now, we're not dissipating enough to come back down to a, a, a cool condition. We, we, still, we just have too much scrub going on in the outer atmosphere. They're saying future measurements and they, everything is future. Well, in the next 20 years we might be able to figure out, ah, 50 years from now we might know what's going on. We're trying to figure out the thermal history of the Earth. Well, the thermal history is it's scrubbing through this. Now, Fermilab, all of them know that the whole space is saturated with this quantum foam, they call it. I can't imagine how they think it's not, that it has no effect on the things scrubbing through it. This is Don Lincoln from Fermilab. This is seven, eight, nine years ago. The quantum foam is real. And he comes up here, he says it's everywhere. There's no escaping it. It's everywhere in the universe. The microcosm is in continual motion. The universe is not only stranger than we imagine, it is stranger than we can imagine. That is a fact, Don. All right, this is the arm of the Milky Way. We're being ripped through, and everything here has to cuss, concuss with all the particles that are in space that it has to plow through. And there is a ton of them. And that is creating this scrub off the side of the sun, and it's creating the same thing on all the other planets. And as they impact, they charge up because the particles they're impacting with are electronic particles. They're electric particles. They charge up whatever's bashing into them. That's what's pushing our magnetic field around the Earth. It's the charging up effect. This is a solar eclipse. Look at all the stuff that's being pushed off of the sun. The Earth is blocking the sun. I mean, the moon is blocking the sun. So we're not looking directly at the sun. That gives us the chance to see all of its radiation. This is the north and south pole of the sun. You see it here and here? This is spinning. The sun is spinning. And it's engaging stronger here. That gives us this little bright spots here. So it's spinning this way. And here it's trailing off. And they're just being pushed back. Here it's scrubbing into it. Here it's dragging away from it. So the sun is spinning this way. Those are all particles. And they have to go somewhere. They just don't stop there. All right. Assume we are on one of these arms of the Milky Way, which we are. We're spinning as this spins through space. Everything spins with a right-hand spin when it's spinning normally. It's called a right-hand rule. Now, why do we see these different lines? What the hell is going on with that? Well, what is going on is this whole thing is spinning. Which means, as it spins, whatever is in front of it here is pushing back against the spin. That's why these arms are concussing with the particles that are in front of it. That's all it is. And because they concuss, they bounce. It's called push to shove. They're pushing, it's shoving back. That ends up pushing this way, shoving back. Pushing this way, shoving back. Pushing, shoving, pushing, shoving, pushing, shoving. And that creates these dark lines in between, is the no man's zone between the radiating particles. And I call it the push to shove no man's zone. Now, if we are coming through space on one of these arms and we are coming through into a spot like this where there's nothing in front of us, we're in good shape. But if we're coming into a spot where there's a whole ton of things in front of us and we're bashing into them, well, we got an issue. 
And that could very well be happening. But the point being is that there is no empty space. There is no empty space. Fermilab says it. No empty space. It's completely saturated with a quantum foam. That is particles. You want to see the particles? I'm going to show them to you right now. Okay, so don't forget, this is European Space Agency, and they say Earth's magnetic field protects us from harmful particles in the solar wind. I agree. But it also is the particles that we're scrubbing against creates our magnetic field. All right, this is John Glenn. He went up 50 years ago into space and saw fireflies. I was on Cocoa Beach that day when he took off in Florida, and um, I was only a kid. But um, I was there and saw that spacecraft go up in the air. And what he saw was, we called them fireflies. Listen to this. In those areas will be the nation that leads the world uh, 50 or 75 years from now. And I think it fits in that category that if we can help inspire some of the kids today to do their own thing in their own time, uh, we'll just be a stepping stone in the future for new achievements that they have. Exactly. It's time for the kids to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute. We're not just going to repeat what we're told. Talk to us about these things. Okay, Glenn was the first American to go into orbit around the Earth. He went, I believe, three times. Orbit the Earth from space, circling the globe three times at speeds reaching 17,000 miles an hour. Now, they're talking about the view being tremendous. Here's what he first originally said, which has been cut out of history. All right, this was the original that he said he saw fireflies. Now watch this. This is Space Link TV. Like it. He's talking to them, and they can't hear him anymore because he is in the midst of all these ionic particles. That interferes with his radio reception. Now listen to this. Uh, they, do, they do have a different motion, though, from me uh, because they swirl around the capsule and then depart uh, back the way that I am looking. Are you receiving? Over. They're not receiving because they can't receive. He is in that layer of scrub zone, which is the ionosphere. And particles coming in are illuminating these particles, which is our atmosphere. That's why it's not going away from him. He's sort of going with the particles that are on our atmosphere. And they are being illuminated. And the only reason he can see them is the only reason he sees them is when he's coming into dark, coming into the light, or when he's leaving the light. And here's exactly the place he is when he can see. All right, the sun's rays come down, so they're hitting here and hitting here and illuminating all the particles that are in space. He's in the darkness of space. Let's say he's coming this way. When he comes here and he's just about getting into where the light is, it's just like being in a barn where there's cracks in the barn and you can see all the dust floating in the air. That's what he's seeing. He's looking out through and he's seeing all the dust being illuminated here. Now he comes up here, he can't see it anymore because everything's illuminated. He comes back down here and he comes out of it and he looks back up here and he can see them all illuminated. They're seven or eight feet apart. That's the push to shove ratio of these particles. They're pushing each other, they're staying a certain distance away from each other because they all have their own charges. That's what's in space. That's what we're scrubbing through. And sometimes it's going to get dense. And if it does, we get heated up. All right, so my claim is, just like John Glenn said, they're just saturated around the Earth. And we're scrubbing through them as we are cascaded and ripped through the arm of the Milky Way. And that is what's creating 2,700 degrees out here, 2,700. 
hundred on Earth. No reason whatsoever for this out here. They cannot explain it, and they cannot explain the sun's corona of millions of degrees and only 10,000 on the surface. I just explained it. Now, if we're going to continue to do what we're doing about global warming, we're just walking around in circles. We have to stop expanding our atmosphere. It is combustion, yes, and a combustion of solid matter into gases creates an envelope that keeps expanding. So if we were here scrubbing and at 2,700 degrees, when we're out here, we're going to be 10,000 degrees. It just keeps hotter and hotter the bigger and bigger the envelope gets, and it's getting big. Okay, my friends, fission and fusion. They're talking about a Z-pinch, which is nothing more, to me, than the Venturi. Now, listen to what he has to say. But we can focus our Venturi onto a receiver of this heat. I don't know if they can. Listen, to, here's what he has to say. The challenge that Zap Energy is trying to address is the same challenge that the industry in general is facing and that we've been facing in the plasma physics community since since after World War II, which is trying to harness plasma physics to bring it to a high density, high temperature object that can sustain a fusion reaction long enough to make commercial energy. The main challenge for harnessing fusion energy in a single word is confinement. Right. Uh, you can do that in a star because they have this huge gravitational field and it keeps it there, you know, nearly forever. On planet Earth, it's really, you know, making a star in a bottle. So it's all about the bottle. All right, it's all about the bottle. Okay, here's how they're making their fusion reaction. Can happen. Neutrons come off of that that type. All right, they're shooting pulse down here, and then they're going to pinch it there, and then they're going to get that heat, and they're going to push it into a liquid metal. It appears. Any little millimeter wide filament, essentially. A millimeter wide. That's very very tiny. Lightning bolt that lets off all of these neutrons. Did you see this flash? Well, I can show you that. And we can just continue it continuously, not just pulse F. We, we just have it continuous. Which go into a liquid metal blanket, um, and that liquid metal blanket is what interfaces with the heat cycles for this. See, they're making a splash, but it's only one time at a time. And then they're containing it here by absorbing it into that heat metal blanket, which is similar to what MIT just... I mean, it's incredible just, to look at something that's three meters long and realize that it can generate 200 megawatts thermal. This is 200 megawatts. That's 200 million watts in that little tube. Well, guess what? We can do it even smaller than that. I don't know about 200 million, but we can do what they are doing, which is to separate and create fission and fusion. Now, I know I've shown this minimum 500 times, but it, somebody's got to pay attention to it. This is light. These are photons. This is all the particles that are in the air that it has to pass through. We accelerate it using a Venturi, created fission and fusion. This is the particle. I've shown this so many times, and I can show it in extreme detail, but it's getting boring. That's the particle. We created fission and fusion. Right here it divided and came back together. And it is identical to what CERN wants to see, and they, which is the muon neutrino, creating the muon sterile muon, electron neutrino, making the showers. We can harvest this right here and take in 200 million watts or whatever they're doing, just as good as they're doing it. Same thing. They're calling this the Z-pinch. Well, we call it the Venturi. And this is seven years ago we had this figured out. And it should be taken advantage of. This is raw energy. That's why they have so much energy in that three meter tube there. You can't put 200 million watts in three meter tube unless you do fusion and fission and fission and fusion. We did it. Time to take advantage of this. And this is cheap. Nothing like what he was showing. This you can do and put in a shoebox and carry it around, right there. The laser creates that extreme glow, and that glow has to be captured by that heat engine, which they had some liquid metal they're talking about. And you could put it in something like this, make all your little different plugs, 50, 60 cycles, AC, DC, any voltage you want. And carry it around like this and take it in the woods. Plug it in, plug your house in, plug your car in, anything you want. And these would almost be free. I mean, the, 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 
the materials to make this are dirt cheap and literally dirt cheap. 